All right. We'll give um, the participants uh, another minute or so. So Brian, you were just telling us how wonderful the weather is in great Ohio. Is that right? Can't wait to bring the divisional series back to Cleveland so we can play <laughs> in the low 40s and rain. Absolutely. I hear it. <laughs> Unlike Southern California. That's right. Where Wick hails from. It's probably 75 and sunny. It's not sunny yet, but it will be a little bit later. We've been having this weird marine layer thing, which is odd for this time of year. But the one thing we can't do in California is really complain about the weather. No. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's one o'clock. Um, I still see quite a few participants jumping in. But I know we have a lot of great content that we want to go over. So um, if, gentlemen, you are ready, I'd say, uh, how about we get started? Let's do it. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. All right. Well, good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I want to say thank you for joining us today. My name is Bruce Orr. I'm founder, CEO, and data scientist at Pronovos. Uh, by education and experience, I'm a data scientist. However, when I was figuring out what I wanted to do with my life, I was torn between two passions. It was either uh, economics or it was data science. I ultimately chose uh, data science, but my love for economics has never faded. Uh, it still plays a big role in how I see the world, especially in how I approach uh, the construction industry. So in this webinar, I'm excited to offer you a unique perspective on how the economy directly influences the construction landscape. More importantly, we'll, dis we'll explore how you can leverage this knowledge alongside the power of technology to stay competitive and succeed. I'm joined by Brian from Foundation Software. Brian, please um, give us an introduction. Absolutely. Good morning or afternoon, everybody. Appreciate you guys joining us here today as well. Um, as Bruce mentioned, I am with Foundation Software, full suite of back office tools to run your construction business. Um, been with the company here for 22 years by education. I am a PR and communications major with absolutely nothing to do with accounting for construction. Uh, I kind of fell into the company shortly after graduating from college and have just developed a love for the construction industry and the technology space and helping people kind of maximize the advantages of technology to run their organizations. Well, I'm so glad to have you, Brian. I know your perspective is going to add a lot to what we discuss. Um, last but not least, I'd like to introduce uh, Wick Zimmerman, who's the CEO of Outside the Lines. He's putting these tools into action every day. Uh, Wick, uh, if you wouldn't mind just uh, giving, us a, uh, giving us an introduction. Sure. Thank you, Bruce, and thanks, thanks for having me today. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Wick Zimmerman, CEO of Outside the Lines. Uh, we're a, a design build specialty contracting firm engaged in uh, primarily water features, but theme construction, artificial rock work, uh, rail rock work for uh, all different industries and um, across the globe, really being in a specialized business like this. So um, by trade, I'm a structural engineer. So uh, finance was uh, kind of far from my uh, original training, but uh, they go to business school. And I've uh, learned quite a bit here from the School of Hard Knocks and uh, been been an entrepreneur really for the last 43 years and various uh, businesses, all really related to construction. Um, so that's my background. And Wick, um, thank you as well for, for being on this webinar. Together, the three of us will dive into how technology can position you to thrive whether the market is booming or facing headwinds. This presentation is slight, slightly different from what I normally do. Um, as I said before, um, I have a passion for economics, um, but I um, my day job is uh, 
is construction technology. So what I want to do uh, as we get started is kind of talk about what you should expect from this, this webinar. Um, we'll talk about the economic cycles, but before we do that, let me set the stage for something that I think all of us will get fired up about. So between 2025 and 2030, I believe we are about to see an explosive um, period of growth and productivity in the industry. One that I think we haven't seen in years, this is going to be a huge opportunity for all of us to take our business to the next level. And today we're going to break through exactly why I believe we're headed for this incredible level of growth, how you can position yourself to maximize productivity, and most importantly, how to prepare for what I believe and a lot of other economists believe a recession that should expect to hit around 2030. But here's the twist. Rather than just weathering the storm, we're going to talk about how you can thrive during that recession, whether it's by being financially prepared to buy your competition or even strategically selling your business. I think there are real opportunities ahead. And this session is going to be interactive, educational, and I believe it's going to be eye-opening for a lot of us. So um, the first thing I like to talk about is um, basically the uh, how we see the world in terms of uh, um, economics, construction, financials, or even life. Um, so everything follows a cycle. And these cycles are predictable, and they consist of four distinct stages where you have your recovery, um, you have your accelerated growth, uh, you have a cooling off period, and then you have um, a recession and it starts all over again. Um, so, you know, when we start with recovery where the economy begins to emerge from a downturn, uh, most of the time we see accelerated growth. I'm sure that uh, WIC, um, you've been around a long time, uh, so you've probably seen this. Um, and and I'm, I'm kind of curious, Wick, I'm going to put you on the spot as it relates to the uh, the cycles. Um, how uh, can you lend any thought to how uh, you have positioned uh, outside the lines to not only thrive during um, a down cycle, but be prepared to grow for what's to come? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a big one, Bruce. But uh, you know, <laughs> I think a, a lot of it is really just, you, you always need to know where you are in the cycle. And like you said, every business has this has a series of cycles. The economy has a cycle, and how we fit into that and understanding how that works is important. And it used to be in my early days, uh, it seemed like it used to be easier because. The economy went through cycles in the construction business. We typically lagged 18 to maybe 24 months um, behind the general economy. So you got a little bit of a um, forewarning when the economy was going to change. But, you know, as time's gone on, that that's gotten more difficult. But, you know, if you if you know where you are, then you can know how to react. And what's interesting to me about it is that how you feel sort of your gut as to where mm -hmm. you think you are is always wrong, right? So when the economy <laughs> is good and you're feeling great, it's getting ready to go into that shrinking growth stage. Um, so that's not the time you necessarily want to be making investments, long-term investments and in, in things, you know, you really should be in a beginning to get into a preserving cash position and uh, kind of knuckling down for what's to come. And same thing goes when, when, you know, you feel like it couldn't get any worse than this. You're at the bottom. This is never going to get any better. You're actually getting ready to begin the recovery stage. And so you can't really do it by gut. You know, you need, you need information, you need data, you need to understand, and then you can make intelligent decisions, you know, on what you need to do, what you should do and, and go about uh, executing a plan. Yeah, no, well said. I think understanding these phases helps us better prepare for what's to come, as you said, Wick, and leverage the right tools 
and strategies for each part of the cycle. Moving forward, I want to share how economists view non-residential construction and the key performance indicators they use to gauge market conditions. One important KPI is the relationship between residential and non-residential residential construction, which I think the word that you use was the market. And then, uh, so, so in, in this case, we're talking about non-residential. Um, so traditionally, residential construction leads non-residential by 24 months, was, as you said, 18 to 24 months. Whatever trends we see in residential typically impacts non-residential two years later. However, what I believe, I believe this dynamic is changing. Given the recent volatility in interest rates, this timeline appears to have shortened to more like nine to 12 months. But before we dive deeper into the correlation between these two sectors, I'd like to discuss another key metric. And, and it's it's the 1212 rate of change. This metric has been widely adopted due to its, I think, high degree of accuracy in forecasting trends. It measures the year-over-year -year percentage change over a 12-month period. And it, it currently projects a significant swing. If you look at my screen, there's a significant swing in the non-residential construction. Um, and you know, this forecast was made before the Federal Reserve made an unexpected move just a few weeks ago when they had an aggressive interest rate cut. Uh, everyone was anticipating something uh, less drastic than a half percent, but that does show that there is some concerns um, that, that um, yeah, as it relates to non-residential, I'm sorry, residential, and I'll show you exactly what that looks like. Um, so, Let's kind of talk about the the um, the nation for a second. Um, as we shift to the housing permits by state, we've seen we've already begun to feel some pain in this area. And I don't, I'm not sure if the people on the call uh, even know this, but most of the country is in a residential recovery phase. But there are a few exceptions, like, for instance, New Mexico, uh, we have Kentucky and, and the green states. So um, when you consider the recent, again, rate cut by the Federal Reserve, it starts to make sense why they made such an aggressive uh, move. Um, and and just to give some clarity to what you see, um, let's take the state of Texas. When you consider August of 2024 compared to August of 2023, they had 15.6 less housing permits pulled, um, and and that and and we we're seeing this everywhere. Again, interest rates went up, so there are not many uh, housing starts. This is one of the indicators that most economists look at. The next indicator that most economists look at is called the Architectural Building Index, the ABI. This is important because it shows how busy architects are and it gives us a sense of future construction activity. So typically anything above 50 signals increase demand. Right now, most regions are below 50, except for the Midwest. However, if we factor in the architectural inquiry index, which measures the number of projects, uh, project inquiries, um, we start to see some signs of, of, of hope. This suggests that the project owners are becoming more comfortable with the current state of the economy. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm telling you all of this because I want to get to um, the future outlook. Um, what we can expect across the country for the next uh, year. Now, remember, this is based on a year-over-year -year rate of change for each state. While it, let me see how I can say this. Um, while it gives us a sense of general direction, it doesn't tell us how long each state will remain in a particular stage. So, it's important to note that the stage doesn't always follow a sequential order. The underlying conditions in each state will determine how things unfold. And 
this, everything I told you actually led up to this particular slide. And I think as um, companies that are in non-residential, this should be really eye-opening for you. So um, basically, um, it, it excites me because it highlights uh, a key message here. Uh, it basically is saying that we are entering a period of accelerated growth across multiple areas of construction. Whether you're in multifamily housing, private office construction, education, healthcare, it doesn't matter. The next couple of years will present an opportunity that I think um, we haven't seen in a while. And and what I want to talk about and what I want Brian and Wick to help us sort of unravel is um, how can we best position ourselves to take advantage of this growth? What obstacles could we prevent from, you know, maximizing our success? And, and, and now is the time to address these issues. So as, as you look at this, what I'd like for our audience to think about is maybe you are experiencing a period of being awarded jobs but you do not have start dates. Now, this is an election year. It's very, very weird. Um, next year is going to be completely different. 2026, hold on because it's going to get really good. And as we go into this, this next slide, we're going to talk about the construction financial life cycle. And it's critical to get your financial house in order during the recovery phase because if you wait until you are in the accelerated growth phase, I would say that you are probably uh, holding on and barely keeping the business uh, plugging holes because there's so much business coming at you. Uh, Brian, I love to bring you in here. As someone who works in construction accounting software, can you share your thoughts on the best practice for the frequency uh, of key financial activities. Sure, absolutely. You know, it's it's interesting because we we come from this this background of wanting to bring everybody into one place, right? We want we want all of our data gathered in in one piece of software so everybody can access it. And and that that paradigm is shifting to have some some more disparate systems, right? Um, Sometimes people are a little hesitant to invite non-accounting staff into their ERP system. Um, but you know, regardless of how you're getting your data out to individuals in the organization, it is important to keep a regular routine to make sure that everybody has their fingers on the pulse of just the overall day-to-day -day project activity as well as the, the cycle of accounting activity, right? So, you know, in your illustration here, right, the project manager reviewing job costs, it, it's critical, right? It's critical to be able to capture data from the field as quickly as possible and get that back into the back office, right? And there are tools out there today that offer remote data capture capabilities, right? You can capture time cards, you can capture um, job performance information, project, uh, daily logs, things like that. All of that can happen out in the field and automatically be pushed into the back office. So that can then help generate more up-to-date cost and production activity so that the project managers can really assess this information on a day-to-day -day basis. They can see, you know, yesterday's activity today and make sure, hey, you know, our production is down. What, what's going on? Is this just an anomaly for the day yesterday? Was there a certain element that got involved? Um, or, or are we really on a, on a downward spiral here on this particular project? So just having that information and be able to make adjustments real time versus waiting a week or two weeks like we used to have to do before things are really out of control. So it just gives everybody a much more warm and fuzzy feeling when they know that the data they're looking at is accurate, it's timely, and it's being managed properly. You know, on the weekly side from, you know, everybody in the back office, just managing their, their payables and receivables, right? You know, illustration is talking about making sure we're, we're following up on our collections, making sure that we are getting paid in a timely manner, you know, um, the payable side, right? Making sure that we're not sending out payments necessarily for, for project materials or subcontract uh, liabilities here, unless we have also been paid for that same activity. 
Um, you know, obviously there's contractual requirements there to to determine whether it's truly pay when paid or or not. But um, you know, those are also things to consider during the pre-job and, and the bidding process is, is looking at those contracts and making sure that you're you're covering it yourself for cash flow purposes, right? I think Wick will talk to that and, and how good companies fold, not because they're they're unable to do work or they perform poorly, but it, it, they're cash strapped and, and it becomes difficult. Um, again, you know, in the project manager realm, um, change orders, change orders, change orders, change orders, right? Making sure that we're asking for change orders when it's appropriate and not only asking, but following up on those requests and making sure that uh, we're continually chasing those down to make sure we get those approvals and make sure that we're adding those to our billings and getting paid, which dovetails into the monthly reporting and our project reviews, right? And our work in process reporting, making sure that all of the data that they're getting out of their accounting system, reporting their job activity can be put into these reports to make sure that everybody knows where we're at, what the position of the job is so we can accurately bill them, right? We don't want grossly overbilled or grossly underbilled projects. I think we'll talk about this in a little while, right? About just making sure that we're making appropriate adjustments in the month in which they need to be made and not sandbagging profits till the end of the project. Mm -hmm. We're not deferring losses until the end of the project because that becomes a whole separate issue when we start talking about banks and bond agencies, right? Um, you know, everybody involved needs to have confidence that as a company, we know what we're doing and we're managing things appropriately in a timely manner. I think that's as well said, um, you know, uh, j just, just to bring us up to where we're at now, we talked about how uh, every economy goes through phases Typically, when things are going really well in an accelerated growth phase, we try to um, start doing investing at that point. And as you were saying, uh, Brian, sometimes, you know, if you're so busy and I've heard this over and over again, contractors typically go out of business when they're too busy to, to, to do all the work that they've taken on, which makes me say, well, if you're experiencing a lull, if you are in a recovery phase, now's the time to start investing. And so, Wick, from your perspective as a CEO, which of these financial activities are most important to you and how often do you and your team perform them to stay financially healthy? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I've said before, uh, Bruce, cash is king. That's the uh, number one most important thing to me. But, you know, it's all really driven from the field. And so that's where the the focus has to be, especially at this stage of of the game when you're in recovery. Because now is the time you have opportunity to to work to improve productivity, your quality control, because things aren't as busy as uh, they will be and have been. So it gives us an opportunity to go back and do some of the uh, housekeeping that that we put off because everybody was was uh, was too busy. So you know, it's getting instilling a culture in the field and the superintendents to project managers that uh, managing the costs at that level are, are important that they know where they are, because, again, you know, a lot, a lot of what we do in construction accounting is historical. We're looking back, we're reporting on what has happened, which is important. It's necessary, but, you know, we're not going that way. We're going forward. So you got to take that information and move it forward, but you have to have good data to start with. Um, otherwise everything uh, that you build on after that is, is flawed. So, um, and, you know, during this recovery stage is when, most contractors are going to feel the cash pinch. You know, if you're a good, good contractor, you obviously have tried to maintain over billings on your job to the extent possible. Um, you know, the economy slows, collections slow. Uh, typically, when jobs get closer to the end, the, the uh, payment cycle gets longer, as most of us have experienced. So you need to have cash reserves, uh, line of credit if, if um, you don't have adequate cash reserves because you got to get yourself through this phase. And, and as Bruce pointed out, you got to start to invest in the accelerated growth phase, because if you wait until cash flow improves, you're going to be behind the curve. Um, you know, some of the things you're going to need to do are, are investments in marketing and 
uh, business development and so forth. Um, when you, when it doesn't feel like it's the right time to do it, but you've got to get a jump on it. So, um, you know, on the cash side and the, the certainly on a weekly basis, uh, monthly basis on billings, weekly basis on collections, you need to be aggressive as to how you bill, um, aggressive as, as to how you collect, you know, work with your vendors to, to slow down payments, maybe increase some payment terms to buy yourself some cash flow on the back end. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, tech techniques and uh, so forth on on managing cash flow to get the most out of it, and this is going to be the time you're going to need that the most. And you know, then when you start to get busy, as we all know, we bill on day one or we work, start work on day one. Day thirty, we submit an invoice. If we're lucky, forty five days later, so on day seventy five, we get ninety percent of what we build. Mm-hmm. Um, I think retention will be. A conversation for another <laughs> webinar because I could go on to on about the archaity of that for uh, for a, quite a while. But um, so cash cash is going to be important. You need to be able to project that um, with reasonable accuracy. And the only way to do that really is um, by having good solid uh, financial information, a good whip, and then also solid uh, financial projections, revenue projections. Uh, where you think you're going to be, how you think costs are going to be incurred. And that if you have that information, it's relatively simple to do, um, you know, a longer term cash flow forecast um, and, and get a better handle on where you're going to be. Um, and you know, I think the one thing that's not on this slide that is important also is data analytics, right? You've got to mm-hmm. know where you've been and know where you're going. And the analytics piece is what's going to help you determine where you are and where you're, where you're headed. What you know, I think all of that is great. Um, and and I, I think that where sometimes companies get hung up at is like, how do you put this into practice? And so what what I know is there is friction that can be an obstacle to uh, getting to this, you know, ideal place. And Wick, since you're, you know, kind of talking about um what you do in your company, I love if you could tell us a little bit about the friction points here. And I think there are four friction points that I'll go over, but, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll back up one. Um, project managers, we know are essential to helping us keep the job moving, essential to billings on this. So, so such a critical uh, resource for us as a company. And, you know, this is where I think, you know, I love to talk a little more about how can we help PMs um, get over some of the friction that they might have uh, to stop us from seeing, you know, or achieving the goals that we want to achieve. Yeah, I think, you know, it really starts with communication, just like, like anything else. And that communication is not only verbal or nonverbal and financial and so forth, um, but you know that, and that's where technology can help you. The you know, like Brian pointed out, in the old days, our job costs were two weeks behind by the time payroll posted and the job costs got run. You know, you're looking at information that was two weeks old, which is hard to do anything with. Um, so I think you know today we can have almost instantaneous communication, which definitely uh, helps that process, but the other is kind of a one of culture, right? So if um, if the organization's culture is more of um, shooting the messenger, or you know, don't bring me bad news, just good news, um, that's what you're going to get. You know, the the project manager is not going to be open with you and say, "Hey, I got a problem on this job." Uh, they're going to try to cover it up or or dismiss it or minimize it and hope that you know, it gets better before the end of the job or uh, they'll at least postpone the beating. So um, I think that's important that, hey, it's we're all here. We're, we're doing the same thing. Um, we can't help you solve a problem or fix an issue if we don't know you have it. So that's an important uh, piece. The other thing is that we got to communicate in the same language, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I don't know how many times you talk to a project manager about earned revenue and they and they go right to billings. You know, like, hey, billings are great. Um, 
by the way, Brian, I, I'm all for grossly overbilling jobs just for the record. <laughs> but, um, as long as you manage that overbilling and you know where that cash is and uh, so forth. But, um, you know, th that's, that's, that's something that you need to, to make sure they understand how we account for costs and revenue on jobs and the billings are, are definitely important, but it's a cash flow in a cash transaction, it's balance sheet related, not income statement related. So um, a little bit of training and understanding, get them to understand how we think on the financial side, um, you know, is is definitely um, important to, to, you know, get everybody on this, the same page. And the other thing is, is giving them access to the information. Sometimes contractors are hesitant to share financial information. Um, but, you know, my philosophy has always been, you can't hold somebody responsible for something you can't uh, or aren't willing to give them the information on. So if you want to hold somebody responsible for, for gross margin on, on a job, then you need to, to let them see what that is, see the cost, understand what's driving everything. So, um, you know, you got to have the information available. You got to be able to share the information and they need to be able to understand it and relay it and communicate uh, to you, to the CFO, to whoever is controller, whoever is evaluating the stuff. If I can add another point to that, uh, one of the key things that I've witnessed in, in the many years I spent out in the consulting realm here, right, is it's not just a matter of the hard dollar costs on the project, right? A lot of project management, uh, especially, you know, other guys out in the field, supers, et cetera. You know, they know what labor is costing. They're, they're looking at their material POs, subcontracts. They know what those dollars are costing on the project. What they're not seeing is the true cost of operations, right? All of the trucks, all the equipment that you guys have, all of the small tools, anything that it takes to run your shop, you know, everything that I, I say is, you know, construction related, but not job specific, right? As opposed to your office admin staff and so on, right? The G&A costs. So many companies convert from simple accounting systems that just don't have more complex capabilities, right? And to get them into the mindset of capturing those, you know, what we'll call indirect job expenses, right? And looking at what that factor is compared to some portion of the job, oftentimes, you know, direct labor, uh, potentially contract, you know, whatever it is, but to be able to tune everybody into look, this is not just us going out and building a building or, or whatever it is, right? There's a lot of support activity that goes behind this. And this is what it truly costs us and sharing that information with them as well so that they know how, how maybe they can conserve, but also maybe on the estimating end to be able to more accurately project and, and build into the budget of a job those expenses. Yeah, yeah, that, that um, Wick, I'm, I'm curious um, regarding what Brian just said. Um, about um you know building those um non-job related things into um or or projecting them um how do you handle that within your organization you know and and it's going to be dependent on the contractor and their philosophy and so forth but um you know we try to put as much directly into the job as you can if it is directly job related so if we have a truck on a job it gets charged to that job um you know if it's a floater or it's delivery truck or it's you know something else that's that can't be attributed to a single job we have indirect costs um uh and you know get amortized over uh, all the various jobs um rather than appearing as a single job cost but it's true. And I think the important part of it is that however you estimate your jobs is how you should account yeah. for them. Right. So if you're, um, you know, if you're tracking costs and you've got, you're, you're going to hit the jobs with a specific cost, whether it's an overhead allocation or uh, truck rental or equipment rental or whatever the case is, you want to make sure that's the way you're bidding your jobs and that you're being consistent. Nothing's getting missed in, in between. And then of course, that's the way you want to, track track the jobs as well um and i think you know, some of the key to that really is you need a system that's reasonably accurate and and detailed enough but it also needs to be something the field can actually track and provide uh, feedback and information on with you know their time card entries 
POs and, and so forth. So that the, the data you're looking at is truly good information and not um, something you think it's much greater than it is. Yeah, I can't, oh. I can't tell you how many times I've seen companies, you know, just throw in a, a you know, 10%, 15%, whatever it is, overhead number into their estimates. And they're not doing anything to actually allocate costs to the project. So they always come in under budget. Jobs look great. And at the you know end of a quarter, end of a period, you know, they're looking at their financials like, wait a minute, all of our jobs are doing great. Why are we not making money? Yep. Mm. That's the driver. I mean, and that's where you know, understand a big picture and having projections and and your financials that uh, are consistent along the way. You can see where you're gonna go. That hey, we've got a certain amount of you can call them indirect costs, but I mean, if you own a truck that you know you're going to have that expense for that truck for for the year whether you drive it or not now mm -hmm. there's variable costs associated with that with fuel maintenance etc but there's certain capital costs that you're going to have to amortize over something and so you need an, enough volume to offset that and you know when you're making decisions on margins for bidding jobs and you know in the recovery stage you're you're probably a little more aggressively going after work uh, but you need to understand what your true costs are. Otherwise, you really have no idea where you're going to end up. And you can never really take your eye off the ball of how much work do I really need to get done in this period of time to make an overall profit for the company. You know, um, Wick and Brian, as as you were talking about some of the problems, I know that it went a little beyond what PMs are experiencing, but a lot of that can be categorized into these eight categories here. Uh, and uh, Wick, I'm going to move us along a little bit. We have just a few minutes to cover a lot of content. Um, I was probably a bit uh, too uh, 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 aggressive with my, with how much content I wanted to cover, but you know, um, it, 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 again, we're talking about how do contractors get the most out of, um, the stage of an economy when things are going really well. And it, it's really important that we're able to do this for this time period that we're experiencing. And I'm going to make sure that I have time to talk about that later. But the, pro you know, the, the job reviews, I feel it is so, so important. And I, I asked you this question the other day, Wick, if a contractor is not doing regular job reviews, say once a month with their PMs to dive in and know what's going on, what recommendations do you have for someone that's not doing that? You, you got to do it. I mean, you <laughs> you got to do it. <laughs> you, gotta, you have to understand what's happening at the job level. And, you know, the more jobs you have and the bigger your company gets, the harder it is to maintain, you know, your, your arms around, all the jobs and in a lot of companies when you start the owners personally involved in most of the jobs and it's sort of second nature you're like i don't really need to have a job review but you get bigger and bigger and you know you do need to do that and you need to to look at you know what are the the key things that you're you're curious to see um you know if the job's way overbilled i want to know why is it overbilled what's what's driving the overbilling and you know that kind of forces a project manager to understand can construction accounting because they've got to go through some math to really calculate what's driving that but you have to have this there's only way you know where the jobs are you want to know if things aren't going well you want to know that ahead of time um, because one if you know it early enough you've got an opportunity to fix it or lessen the the blow of it uh, secondly you know certainly from a reporting standpoint we're all graded uh, on the accuracy of our projections and and financials. And so you know, you're much better off to know there's a problem with a job or a job's going to be exceptionally good well ahead of time than find out after it's done and you, you issue the final report on it. So just to uh, jump in, um, job reviews, you did, you still do every month. Um, you, you have um, several PMs that spend, used to spend hours going through cost reports, going through Excel, uh, trying to be able to answer whatever questions you have. And today you use Pronovos. What does it look like today? 
You know, it makes it so much easier, Bruce, because like everything else, once you get into Excel, everybody has their own system, their own way to make it better. Um, and they present the information in different ways. And, you know, with Pronovus, one, you've got incredible visibility. So as the guys are doing their uh, cost forecasts or, you know, we used to call it projected final cost, cost to complete uh, reports, that's visible to me or anybody else that has access to it. So you can see they're working on it, where the job is. Um, and then the whole process of these are the things that we're going to cover in each job reviews. So you're going to talk about the financials. You're going to talk about change orders. You're going to talk about billings, talk about collections. We're going to talk about schedule. We're going to talk about issues there may be. Um, and all those things with the Pronovos um, job reviews set up, it's right there. So everybody kind of, kind of walks through, they can add notes, they can put in the information that's necessary. And uh, it just, it, it makes it faster and more efficient you know, to have job reviews. And you know, we go through every single job every month. Um, so, you know, if you've got 60, 70 jobs um, and, and you're not doing it efficiently, it can be a, a painful experience for everybody. And obviously what comes out of the job reviews later on, it hits the whip. And, and that's where you find efficiency and accuracy in your whip reporting. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things I look at is, hey, if the projected final cost on a job is varying or continually bleeding out uh, over time, um, you know, that's something you want to understand and look at and be able to to drill into. And, um, you know, you're able to do that with the right technology and tools like Pronovus and Foundation and it makes all the difference in the world. You know, it, it it makes uh it makes a lot of sense. I hope the audience is uh, picking up um, what we're putting down. And when you consider technology, we know that you got two major groups: financials and operations. Uh, from the financial perspective, I know that Brian, you and Wick can speak at length about the KPIs most companies should be looking at when they are running their business. Um, the three up here. Uh, we had, I don't know, a 15-minute conversation just talking about the importance of earned revenue. Um, before I uh, sort of fast forward us to uh, the, uh, the the end where we talk about more about what's to be expected in 2030, any, anything you guys want to add to this? I don't know. I think Wick, Wick pretty much said it, right? Cash is king. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned not being grossly overbilled or underbilled on a project. And, and Wick said, well, I'd like to be grossly overbilled, right? Absolutely. You know, if you can manage, if you're capable of overbilling and collecting and managing that cash, absolutely. You know, when you're borrowing from one job to pay for another, though, that's a big problem, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's that overall awareness. And I think, you know, kind of what you guys were talking about is letting that knowledge trickle down to the project management team. Um, because, you know, while their primary role is to manage the progress of a job, they need to understand the financial impacts of that as well and and what is good for the company and why we're doing things the way we're doing things and you know if you can protect those profit margins and cover that earned revenue cash flow hopefully will manage itself yeah yeah i think that's that's well said and you know the way we see things is uh, profit and cash flow. They, you know, it's 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 one coin, two sides, uh, and this is what we do well. You know, we try to protect and improve your cash flow. The reason why we do that is because we understand the importance of building a lasting construction firm. And Wick, I know you are all prepared to talk about the five elements of what makes a lasting construction firm. Uh, and if there's one or two that really uh, 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 stands out that you want to speak to, please go for it. I mean, I think the number one thing out of all these, Bruce, is culture is, is critical because mm -hmm. that's going to determine your, your future. And the rest of this kind of plays on, on that. Um, you know, I've always been a big believer in innovation and, being adaptable i think that gives us the ability to be flexible when the economy changes the market changes things change people change um 
you know, so I, I think those are, are important aspects of it for sure. And, you know, obviously the others we've talked about to some degree or another. I love it. I love it. Um, you know, as, as we are getting close to the end here, I'm going to ask the audience, I rarely do this, but if you have just an additional three to five minutes to hang on, I want to talk about something that is really important that I think that you all should be aware of. We talked about how from now through the end of the decade, there's going to be an opportunity to make, uh, to be highly productive and get your company to a level that uh, you may not have been able to get it to before. The reason for this is because after the end of the decade, um, a lot of economists, and I've combed through the data to confirm, and I see why they believe this, we're going to have a deep recession. And I'm not saying this because, um, you know, I'm just, you know, a, a parrot just talking about what I have um, uh, heard others say. I've, I've dove into the data, and this is where it stems from. In 1964, we had 191 million people that were born. They are now our baby boomers. Back then, they made up 39.3% of the population. And if you think about it, you are somewhere within this generation, right? So 75 million, that was a huge number. Millennials came after that. I'm part of the Gen X. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the forgotten about generation. Uh, but think about the labor force. Think about um, how the baby boomers have contributed to the labor force. Um, you know, just to look at this, 15 to 20 percent of the baby boomers make up the workforce. That's going to decline. And approximately 25 to 30 30% of them are still working and they are going to come out of, of working. I love this slide. I wish I had more time to talk about it, but this slide actually, it talks about uh, the, the workforce by age. So what's really interesting about this slide is, and in, in today's standards, these are the baby boomers. In 2000, and, sorry, the baby boomers that we know of today. In 2001, they actually crossed over from this early. This is the uh, 20, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, and then 45 to 50. These were all of the people that were participating in our labor force. And if you don't know, we are now back at pre-COVID um, uh, labor levels. So, so, so we're not uh, hemorrhaging labor like we used to. But going back to what I was saying about the people that are working today, it's really interesting when you see this overlay, this 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 crossover with uh, with the fifty five to sixty four, um, you start to notice that they began to come back into the workforce. And again, these are the people that were young, that were born in nineteen sixty four, that are working today. The reason why they came back, there was something that was really important that happened on uh, in two thousand one. Can any of you tell me what that was? 9-11-2001. Yeah. All right. So, 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 you know, th this was the day the, um, you know, the, the, the plane crashed. Um, and, and, and at that point, a lot of people lost their savings. A lot of people saw their retirements being uh, decimated. They went back to work. The younger people that were working, they said, gosh, I can't find a job. Let me go back to school. So I'm showing this to show you that while the uh, baby boomers, they have contributed significantly to our workforce today, starting in 2030, 2031, we're going to start seeing um, a big change that is related to how we spend money as a government. And I can go over the details and tell you why healthcare needs is going to impact us but what I'm going to do is advance to the slide that I think everyone should be um, most concerned about. And that is uh, basically our inflation. We're going to have a higher inflation after 2030 because we need to start. Um, we have to print more money to make up for the liabilities that we have as a government. That impacts us. The reason why I'm telling you this is because at this point, if you have run your construction firm well and you've taken the suggestions that uh, were laid out today, you should be in a position to start buying assets that are um, uh, going to be somewhat discounted 
Uh, and, and, and I say this because I personally have witnessed this. I have a uh, father-in-law. Uh, he's a general contractor. He's the baby boomer. He wanted to get out of the business. And so he basically said, I don't have anyone to give it to. So I'm going to sell it. And he sold it. He, he made out pretty well. But, um, you know, I think that others will look at that transaction and say that uh, he could have gotten a lot more for it. The purchasers were really happy about that. And I think there are going to be more and more transactions to come. So if you're financially sound, you're going to have an amazing opportunity to build a company that is going to sustain multiple generations. Um, you know, let, let, let me also say I'll end it with this. The, you, the United States is in a phenomenal position as it relates to the age of our generations. We are, um, uh, com, you know, compared to others like China, that was a one, one country that we uh, felt was a, com, um, uh, a, a high competitor. But I feel like based on the data, we are in a good state in terms of uh, where we're at. And I believe that you know, if you follow everything that we talked about, if you have questions about what are some of the technologies that, you know, Pronovos offers or some of the technologies that uh, that, that a um, foundation offers to help us, what are some of the processes? You can always reach out to us um, and, and, and get more information, but I will encourage you not to put your head in the sand. Don't wait. I think that you need to act. And so what I'm going to do for those that were – um, staying on, I'm going to uh, try and launch a, uh, a quick, um, uh, I think I'm going to do a poll or a quiz. And listen, if you want to hear from us, let us know. We'll love to talk to you and tell you more about everything that, um, that, that we've been uh, speaking about. However, um, you know, um, I know that we, we went over and I appreciate you for staying uh, with uh, Brian, uh, any last words that you'd like to uh, impart upon us? Any wisdom at all? Hey, I think just uh, keep your eyes open, your ears open, and um, and be optimistic. You know, there's a lot of pessimism out there. We as contractors are typically more optimistic, but like Bruce said, there are an incredible number of opportunities that come out of downturns as much as they do in upturns. So mm -hmm. the key is to recognize the opportunity, see it, and be able to seize it. I love it. What say you, Brian? I'm with Wick. You know, there's, <laughs> there's you know, it's not so much a, a matter of positive and negative as much as it is. It, it just is, right? And it's what you make of it, and taking advantage of of what you can when the economy is down, and you know, just capitalizing on it as much as you can, yeah. and being prepared. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. And and so the audience, I. Hope that you really got something out of this. Um, I feel like what we do is we try to provide educational content to help you. Uh, if, again, you have any questions, you want to reach out to us, feel free. The information is uh, is on the screen. And thank you, Wick. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Foundation, for being such a great partner. Uh, I uh, hope that you enjoy some great weather. And to everyone that, that, that's, uh, that joined, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.